We're talking about Christ our life. And if you have your Bibles, be fine in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to continue where we left off last week. I only got to hit one of the points that we were talking about. We talked about Colossians 1 through 3, where, or 1 through 5, where it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated on the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. There he tells us, he says, Christ is our life. Jesus is our life. If Jesus is you take Jesus away from us, we do not have life. That's why Paul could say, when, when he said in Philippians chapter 1, 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is, it is Christ living in me. Christ is literally my life. You see, Jesus didn't just point us to life. Jesus said, I am the life. Now, without Christ, you do not have life. And so we talked about that. We talked about how that there's so many people today that, 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 that are walking around that think they have, like they're, they're drawing their breath and drawing their side, but they're not really living the life that God has called us to. And we said that this section of Scripture gives us some things to tell us about how to live the life that Christ would call us to do. There are a lot of people that don't understand it. And we said in Colossians chapter 3, gives us some tools, 1 through 5. First of all, we said there was the things that we need to seek, and then there are the things that we need to set, and then there are the things that we need to put to death. Let's look at that. The first one is the ambitions of our life, the things that we seek. And we talked about that. He says in verse 1 there, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated on the right hand of God. God wants us to set our hearts to God. You see, Satan doesn't care whatever you, what, it, what it is that you would like to have. You know, some things that we seek sound good, but the devil doesn't care as long as you don't seek those things which are above. And, and last week, we talked about some of those things that get in our way. And we said in Colossians 2, 8, and Colossians chapter 2 gives a lot of stuff. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceitful philosophies, which depend on human traditions and elementary spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. You see, there are things that Satan wants to draw us away, and we talked about last week, that he'll draw us away, doesn't matter what it is, the reasonings of the world, you know, those things. And he says the vain philosophies, and there's all kinds of ideas and things, and people that want to learn, and they're ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. And he says, you know, whatever it is that'll pull you away, the reasonings of the world. And we said the rituals of the world. You know, all these different things, you know, we do these things, and a lot of times, even in the church, we have these things where we... We, we're after, you know, the rituals. You can't, you know, you, you, could, you could worship anything, including rituals that you have. You know, and again, I, I know, I, and I gave some examples last Sunday of some of the rituals that we get into, you know, and, you know, and, and that we get caught on. We think, you know, they just have to be done a certain way. I, I mentioned serving the Lord from the back. We made simple changes in the church, and sometimes people get in an uproar over simple things that are going on because they've caught up in those things. Then we said the religions of the world. You realize that it was religious people who crucified Jesus? Satan's not opposed to religion. You could be up to your neck in religion. The people who crashed the planes into the World Trade Centers were religious people. You can have religion and not have Jesus. And it, it, but, but if you're distracted by the religions of the world. And then we said there was also the rigors of the world. You know, he, he talks in Colossians chapter 2 there about touch not, taste not, handle not. These things seem to be a thing of wisdom. But he says in reality they're will worship. You're worshiping your own will, your own ability to do or to not do certain things. A lot of people in, that, that, that have that idea that, you know, if I keep this list, this dirty dozen, whatever it is, and they say, you know, if I have those things, if I can do those things, I'll be okay, I'll be all right, I'll be fine. You know, the, these rigors of the world, you know, you, you, you don't, you know, you don't go out and you don't, uh, you don't dance and you don't, you don't drink and you don't smoke and you don't do those things. Say, oh, if I just don't do these things, I'm going to be okay. And if I come to church three times a week and if I 
give and I, I do all these things. I'm going to be great and I have all these, these rigors. And if you keep all these rules and regulations, you're going to be okay. And he says, he says, those things seem to be wise. But he says, it's real worship. Then we get to where we are today. He says, the next thing is, not only those things, not only the, the religions of the world and the rigors of the world and, the, and the, all these different things, the rituals of the world and the reasons of the world, but then he talks about another thing that will get your attention. The first verb, he says, seek. He speaks of your ambitions. If you want to live a great Christian life, don't get negative about it. Seek Jesus. He's your life. Seek those things which are from above. Then the second thing has to deal with our affections. Now I want you to see the second verb. The first verb deals with your ambitions, what we seek. The second verb deals with your affections, what you love. Look at verse 2 again. He says, set your affections on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Now the word affection speaks of your thought life, the things that you love. You know, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You know, you, 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 what you think is who you are. And so he says, you need to be careful what you think. This verse speaks about your thought life. Set your affections, the things that you think about, on things above, not on things of the earth. A lot of us, though, have got our minds in all different directions. We, we're, we, it's hard to even focus when you're here. You're, you're thinking about, you know, uh, it's 4th of July weekend. Are we going to have a picnic? Are we going to do these things? Are we, who are we going to have over? What are we going to do? Is David going to be able to be with the people he wants to be? You know, whatever it is, you know, you got all these things on your mind. You're thinking about these things. And, and, you, know, and, and you know, we can be distracted. He says, set your mind on things that are above Think on those things which are above. The Bible says you keep your heart with all diligence. And, and so that is that you are not to let it go. You're, you're to guard your heart. Now, you know, you want to, you, you go home tonight, you know, go home tonight and, and you, you get ready to go to bed. You wouldn't open all your windows and all your doors and all the different things, especially, uh, you know, if you know some of, the, some of the things in the area that I know of, because, you know, people may come in. You, you want to shut them out. You, you don't want the things to come in that you don't want in. You know, let's just open all the doors and windows. Let's just see what might happen. Would you do that? Not if you lived in some of the places I've lived. You keep your home with all your diligence. The Bible says you're to keep your mind with all diligence. Now, let me tell you a secret about a healthy thought life. By the way, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. So if you keep putting these negative things down in your life, it's going to come up. You know, someone says, you know, they let a, a curse word slip. And they say, man, I don't know where that came from. I know where it came from. It's down in there. You've got it in you. you. You need to get those things out. You need to push those things out of your life. And you need to put the positive things in your life. Let me tell you a secret to healthy thought life. Set your affections on those things which are above. He tells us in Philippians chapter 4, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, praiseworthy, what does it say? Think on these things. There's how you get a positive spiritual life, thinking on the right things. You know, it's hard to do that when you watch some of the things that you watch on television. You can't even watch the news and, and think on these things. You need to be careful what you put in because what you put in is what comes out. So, you need to ask yourself, is it true? Is it noble? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? Is it excellent or praiseworthy? If it doesn't meet that criteria, you need to put it out of your life. When you look at that show, just ask this question, is it true? Is it, is it noble? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Just ask yourself those questions when you, when you watch that show, when you read that book, when you do that thing, whatever it is that you do. Set your affection. Can you see the resolution of the will? Can't you see it in, in the word a set? Have you set your affections on things above? It, it deals with your thought life. And again, you know, some of us need to check up for the neck up. You know, we need to, we need to 
change the way we think. If you want to change the way you act, you're going to have to change the way you think. Think on these things. Set your mind on those things which are above. There's so many in the world, that if they would just change the way they think. They are so negative about everything. Listen, you can find something to fuss about in any situation. You come, it's amazing to me, you, you come to church and there'll be some people that they can find every little thing that's wrong. I, I, I joke, you know, in the bulletin, uh, try to, that you know, somebody come up and point out something wrong in the bulletin. I say, well, you know, I, I want to please everybody and there's some people just, all they want to do is find something wrong and so we always put something in there just so everybody be happy. You know, uh, you because know, there's some people who that's, they spend their life, that's all they can do is point out what's wrong with something. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of normal. If I were to put a, you know, take a piece of paper and, and put a dot in the middle of that paper and hold it up here and say, what do you see? Most of you say, I see a black dot. Because that's what we see. We see the black dot. We don't see all the other stuff around it, the white and all that, the purity that's around it. We don't see that. That's what we, we always see the negative in everything. You've got to train yourself. You've got to teach yourself. You've got to set your mind to those things. You got to, that's got to be your ambition. You've got to say, okay, no, I know that there's some things. I mean, you come in our church. It won't take you long. You can find if, you, if you're looking hard enough, you can find what you want to fuss about. There's always something to fuss about. But there's also so many things to praise about. There's always so many things to, to thank God for. There's so many blessings and just having these good brothers and sisters and having a good set, of, you know, just having a congregation where you have leaders in the congregation. I remember when I came back from Russia and we'd been there for five years and, and, and you know, the church was in its infancy and, and we had to do it all. When we first started, I mean, yeah, I remember when I first started preaching, going to a little church in Arkansas and there was just a handful of people and I had to lead the prayer and I had to help on the Lord's supper table and I had to help with the leading of singing and, and then I did the preaching and all those different things because they just didn't have the people there to do it it's mostly women and it was just one or two men and some of them weren't worth count weren't worth much and uh, uh you know and so you know, but I, 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 when I, I remember coming back from Russia and having to do so much and coming in with an, uh, coming in where we had a good set of elders and, and a, a good set of deacons and, and a church that's willing to get in there and jump in and do things. And I, you know, I just, it, just, it was just amazing. But we take that for granted. You guys, we have some of the most wonderful children of any congregation I've ever been in right here in this congregation. You want to look for a blessing? Just look around at these kids. You look at these teachers that we have. Look at these servants that we have in this congregation. The, the idea is, you know, this idea of the, uh, the, uh, the, the giveaway that we're going to be doing here in just a few weeks for the school giveaway. You know, that, that, it wasn't like, you know, the preacher did that. That was the young family said, hey, we want to do something. We want to get involved. We want to do something and reach out to the community. The young family said, why don't we do this? They came up with the plans and they're going to, they're going to be the ones that going to run this thing. Isn't that great? Think on these things. There's so much negative out there in the world. You can think of politics. Automatically, you think negative. You can think of inflation. Automatically, you're thinking negative. When you think of, you know, watch, again, watch the, the news, you're going to think negative. I mean, they sensationalize all the negative that's going on out there. Think on these things. That doesn't mean that we sweep under the rug the things that need to be fixed. We, we do need to find the things that we can fix. But I'm going to tell you some things you, that you can't do anything about. Somebody, I was talking to somebody today. I'm not going to mention Amber's name. But, you know, I was talking to her and, and about, you know, she's talking about you know, stress and all these things. I said, listen, you need to think about, you need to, you know, what is it that you're stressed about that you can fix? Then fix them. What is it that you're stressed about that you can't? Put it away. Get rid of it. If you can't fix it, why are you worrying about it? You can't do nothing about it anyway, and worry's certainly not going to help it anymore. But she's just like all of us. You know what I mean? We get caught up in the things that we don't even have any control over. Then we get caught up in the things that we can make a difference in, then make the difference in them and quit worrying about them. Think on these things. The first verb has to deal with your ambitions, the things that you seek. What are you looking for? There's all kinds of things that are good things. What are you looking for? Look for those things which are above. 
The second one has to do with your affections, the things that we, that, that are the, the, the ambitions that we have. And, and then you had the affections, the things that we love. What do you love? What is it you care about the most? Then the third thing has to do with your alienations. The things that we hate. Look at verse 3. Put to death, therefore, whatsoever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. The word there, the King James uses the word mortify. It, it means, again, to put to death, but not just to put to death, to put to get death immediately and forcefully. You see, then you'll have as little desire for whatever those things are as a dead man has. Put it to death, he says. So then he lists all these different things that need to be put to death. And that means that you're to hate those things. Did you know you can't be a good Christian without hating? You know, a lot of people come and say, wait a minute, you know, God is love and we ought to love things. We're to be, we're to be love, we the love and all those different things. You know, people think that it's wrong to hate. And it's, it's wrong not to hate. A Christian needs to learn to hate. Again, you say, but well, we're supposed to love. Well, we are supposed to love. But you see, you cannot love something without, without having the negative quality of hating something. You can't have love without hate any more than you can have high without low, any more than you can have hot without cold, any more than you can have in without out. For example, if you love justice, then you're going to hate crime. If you love health, then you're going to, love, you're going to hate those things that destroy your health. You're going to hate germs and all diseases and all that kind of thing. If you love flowers, then you're going to hate weeds that choke out your flowers. God is love, but God is also a God of hate. You say, well, I never thought about God being a God of hate. Well, it's about time you did. Proverbs chapter 6, he talks about this. He says, there are six things the Lord, there's that word, hates. Seven are detestable to him. Not only does he hate, he hates them with everything. And he goes on and he lists those things. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceives wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You see, for a man that says he loves something without correspondingly hating that thing which is an enemy of the things that he loves, it's a sheer hypocrisy. When a man says Christ is his life, and he, sexes, he sets his affections on things that are above. Therefore, he will put to death certain things that are below. It's all right for you to hate certain things. You ought to hate them. Look again. Psalm 119, 104. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Isn't that interesting? He gives you the thing you should love and gives you a corresponding thing that you ought to hate. I, I gain understanding from your, your precepts. In other words, I love your word. I, I love what God teaches me. I love his Bible and what he has to say to me. Therefore, what? I'm going to hate the wrong path. I'm going to hate those things which oppose to that. You see, you cannot have a love for the Bible without having a perfect hatred for error. Look at verse 163. I hate and detest falsehood, but I love your law. You see what he's saying there? You know, if you love his law, you're going to hate that thing which is opposed to the law. You're going to, if you love God's word, you're going to go back and look at verse 113. He says, I hate vain thoughts because, he says, because I, your, uh, your law do I love. You see, Christians love but they hate those things that are opposed to that things which they love. So there's some things, you know, you set your mind on things that are above. You're to love those things. Your mind is supposed to be set on, on you know, whatever's good and honorable and all those different things. If you just take the negative of those things, those are the things you ought to hate. 
There is those things. You're going to put them to death. You're going to have as much desire for those things as a dead man has. And so he says that's how it works. So the first verb, seek, that deals with your ambition. We are to seek the Lord Christ with as much as in us. The things that you're looking for the most ought to be the things of God. The second verse, set your affections, deals with your, your affections, the things that you love, your thought life. And then the last verb, mortify or put to death, is the things that you alienate yourself from. The things that you hate, the things that you, that you stand against. Now, Christ is all in all, and these scriptures will be fulfilled in us if we realize that. I want you to look at Colossians 3, 10 and 11. He says, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of, our, of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. So what is it that you need? Your need is not really to pray more. You need Jesus. What's your need? Your need is not really, in reality, the church. You need Jesus. What is it that you need? Your need is not really to read the Bible more. Your need is Jesus. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you don't need to pray or that you need, don't need to love the church. You know, I love the church but I want you to know, friend, that when you have Christ and you've surrendered your will to his will, you will pray and you will love the church and you will understand the Bible because those are the things that you love. That's where your mind is. Those things will come a natural result of what you love. Christ is your life. And you don't let anything or anybody move you from that. It is that thing which you seek. It is that thing which you think about. It is that thing, it's, it will cause you to start putting aside those things that are opposed to it. Christ, who is our life? That's where we need to be. That's what we need to seek first. Now, if you're here this morning and you want to put on Christ, you believe in Christ, willing to turn from your sins, confess your faith, be baptized into Christ, he can make all things new. Matter of fact, he says, he, he tells us that in 2 Corinthians, but he tells us here in Colossians that we need to seek those things. We need to seek those things which are in Christ. You start by coming to Christ. You need to change the way you think. You need to change the things that you love. All those come through your relationship with Christ and if we could help you this morning I want to encourage you as we stand we offer the invitation